It's my privilege to address you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Quixotes of the world, as we saw a moment ago. I seem to find myself at conferences like this. I've been doing this since the 19, late 1970s. And what does interest me now is we are coming to that interesting political and economic context in which it's all coming together. Now, my topic is constitutional perspectives, and therefore I have to talk about both silver and gold. Because in the constitutional system, we're not under a gold standard, per se, but under a, what I like to call a dual metallic system. Silver and gold are not merely valuable commodities. They're not merely investments. They're not even merely media of exchange. More importantly, they are key checks and balances in America's legal and political institutions. So the fight against silver and gold as money that has been waged by bankers and rogue politicians since the 1870s as to silver and the 1930s as to gold and will intensify as fiat currencies collapse throughout the world is ultimately directed against America's national independence, her constitutional government, and every common American's individual liberty and prosperity. The Constitution of the United States adopted a monetary system consisting of silver and gold, in which the standard is the silver dollar, containing 371 and a quarter grains of fine silver, and the value of the gold coins are to be measured in dollars according to the free market's rate of exchange between silver and gold. So it's fundamentally a free market system. Neither the general government nor any state is authorized to emit paper currency. These restrictions prevent rogue politicians and officials from turning public debts into currency as a means for redistributing wealth from society to political elitists and their clients and special interest groups. Furthermore, although the Constitution does not mention banks, either public or private, its only correct construction requires separation of bank and state, extirpation of all inherently fraudulent fractional reserve banking systems, and rigorous regulation of all other arrangements that might operate fraudulently. I wrote a book on this subject a few years ago. It's 1,700 pages. I won't try to encapsulate it today. Uh, shortly, it's coming out in the CD version. But since the 1800s, early 1800s, in fact, Politicians and bankers have steadily subverted the Constitution by forging an increasingly tight relationship between bank and state. Through the grant of one abusive special privilege and another, politicians have immunized fractional reserve banking against the just economic and legal consequences of its own inevitable failures, so that public officials and bankers could turn both public and private debts into currency thus separating the supply and the purchasing power of currency from the economic discipline of the free market and rendering those matters largely political in nature. Under the Federal Reserve System, Americans no longer enjoy money in the economic sense, but are subjected to what must be denoted political currency, with emphasis on the adjective. Political currency is emitted on the basis of political debts, that is, either public debts or private debts for the payment of which the creditors expect public bailouts if the debtors default. Ultimately, the Federal Reserve System is inherently unstable and must lurch from one self-generated crisis to another, each increasing in severity until the House of Cards finally self-destructs. Having separated society's medium exchange from the production of real goods and services in the free market, and instead link the currency to creating, packaging, marketing, servicing, and eventually salvaging political debts, the Federal Reserve System encourages, facilitates, and rewards irresponsibility on the part of both lenders and borrowers in the private as well as the public sector. Now, in order for those who benefit from this system to continue to loot society, the supply of political currency must continually expand. For that supply to expand, political debts must increase. True enough, political debts can increase, even geometrically, because political currency can be created, as the saying goes, out of nothing. But real wealth cannot be generated simply by the emission of paper promises. Neither can new paper promises pay off old ones. So, avarice being unlimited, insatiable, and imprudent, the whole operation must accumulate and culminate in an unsustainable burden of debts that either implodes in a depression or explodes in hyperinflation or one followed by the other. 
Although the Federal Reserve System is fatally flawed, the wealth and power of elitists in high finance, big business, and the political class depend upon maintaining it or replacing it in a timely fashion with something of equal serviceability for their ends. As it cannot long be maintained, it must and soon will be replaced. But with what remains a matter for speculation. Not open to the slightest doubt, however, is that as crises have rocked this system, the establishment has always moved farther away from the Constitution to shore up the banking cartel and always at common Americans' expense. In the 1930s, in response to the collapse of the fractional reserve racket, rather than reforming the bank's operations, the Roosevelt administration and his pliant New Deal Congress seized the American people's gold and outlawed almost all public and private contracts promising to pay in gold. In the 1950s through the 1960s, until the Nixon administration finally terminated redemption of Federal Reserve notes in 1971, the inflationary policies of the Federal Reserve System drained off more than half of America's national stock of gold to foreign banks and to the profiteers operating through them. And during the last few decades, as we've just heard, surreptitious manipulation of the precious metals markets has kept the price of gold, measured in Federal Reserve notes, suspiciously low, even as this country's financial structures have become increasingly shaky. Now, the, that the price of gold has been manipulated is easily explicable. There are really two reasons, one being the suppression of evidence, and the other, the throttling of monetary evolution. First, an ever-increasing price of gold reflects the breakdown of the Federal Reserve System, just as an ever-increasing temperature reveals that the human body is sick and when it reaches a critical point that death is imminent. Second, those who fatten off political currency need to prevent ordinary people from realizing that only a return to silver and gold as common media of exchange can stabilize America's economy, and especially they want to prevent common Americans from actually employing silver and gold in preference to Federal Reserve notes in day-to-day -day transactions. As the Federal Reserve's system experiences ever more frequent, ever more serious, and ever less tractable problems, however, downward manipulations of the prices of gold and silver will become impossible. And that the system is beyond repair will become apparent to all. At that point, the question will arise, and behind the scenes it doubtlessly already has arisen among politicians and bankers, as to how and with what to replace this banking cartel. Well, history gives us an idea. When a political currency has failed in this country, as all of them have, the bankers and politicians' traditional trick has been to introduce a new, supposedly more stable currency, often within a new, supposedly more stable banking apparatus. That was the sleight of hand that moved America from the independent state banks in operation prior to the Civil War, through the partially cartelized national banks created in the 1860s, to the fully cartelized Federal Reserve System established in 1913. Throughout this devolution, the progression of illegality has become increasingly stark. The state banks violated Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 of the Constitution, but at least they operated only regionally. The national banks violated Article 1, Section 8, Clause 2, and operated throughout the country, but at least their emission of paper currency was limited by the amount of public debt that a generally thrifty Congress in those days was willing to incur. The Federal Reserve System, though, is a corporative state, or let me use the correct term, fascist structure, that purports to delegate Congress's supposed monetary powers to private interests. And the system's bubble of both public and private debts will expand to the limit of the avarice of the cartel's operators, its clients, and their political henchmen. Nonetheless, as unconstitutional and economically unsound as they were and are, all of these schemes operated and even now operate under color of the national sovereignty and laws of the United States, subject in principle to control by the American people. Indeed, Section 30 of the Federal Reserve Act still explicitly reserves to Congress the right to repeal, alter, or amend any part of the system or all of the system at will. But with the Federal Reserve System, bankers and politicians have gone about as far as they can within the economic and political institutions of the United States. And they have separated paper currency from the discipline of free markets about as far as possible while still pretending to maintain some semblance of a connection to free markets. So as the Federal Reserve System shakes itself to pieces, 
The likelihood is that, first, a new currency will arise outside of the United States in some regional supranational entity, such as the proposed North American Union. And second, the value of this new currency will not be controlled by free financial markets, but instead propping up the currency's value will be the excuse for extensive governmental regulation in and manipulation of the markets. Now this plan is so alien to the experiences and desires of most Americans that its implementation will probably require a controlled meltdown of the Federal Reserve System to bludgeon us into accepting the North American Union or whatever structure they create as the only way to obtain a new supposedly stable currency and to return to something approaching economic normalcy. Yet even such a controlled meltdown along with the company absorption of the United States into this northern hemispheric political order will unavoidably generate economic, social, and political unrest that will surely threaten the financial establishment's position and power. Even dumbed down Americans will not long suffer conditions of depression akin to those of the 1930s, let alone South American levels of inflation as well. Desperate people will begin to ask questions and soon they will assign blame. Perhaps not just a few will abandon debt currency altogether and substitute silver and gold as their media of exchange. They and others will conclude that the Federal Reserve System is unconstitutional and therefore its operations are arguably a complex of criminal offenses. Many will realize that the establishment scheme for replacing Federal Reserve notes with some supranational currency is a political crime on a more stupendous scale yet because it depends upon destroying both the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. At that point, it will be interesting to see what an aroused people will do in terms of taking political action. Of course, on the other side, the establishment will not be idle. It will not sit by on its hands, waiting for events to overtake it. It will instead do anything and everything possible to maintain its position. Obviously, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence will be expendable because the establishment has been trying to whittle away the former on a piece-by-piece -piece basis over the years and intends to do away with the latter at one fell swoop in the near future. So this country as an independent nation will be expendable too. And if this country, why not the freedom and prosperity of common Americans as well? Well, will ordinary Americans, at least 80 to 90 million of whom are armed, meekly put up with a program aimed at their country's assisted suicide? Why should they when they have nothing to lose, economically or politically? If they do not refuse to knuckle under, the establishment's only recourse will be attempt to lock down the whole country under some kind of paramilitarized police state, with perhaps the assistance of peacekeepers from Canada and Mexico, for the employment of which negotiations are apparently already in progress, if you've been keeping up on that matter, on the, on the internet at least. That is why some observers conclude that the paranoia that is being generated by politicians and the big media over homeland security and the frenetic paramilitarization of law enforcement agencies at the national, state, and even local levels in the name of homeland security are not caused by or aimed at foreign terrorists at all, but instead target ordinary Americans in their own hometowns. The establishment is simply preparing to force justifiably angry Americans into line when the financial house of cards comes tumbling down. And Americans will not be the only victims of this repression. The establishment must prevent other peoples in other parts of the world from jumping off the financial treadmill of political currency. That will require the use not only of economic and political pressure, but also, and I would say indeed, especially military coercion. For the provision of which, of course, the establishment will attempt to force Americans to pay and to send their sons and even their daughters off to fight and die and be maimed and poisoned in foreign lands. So little good will do us or the country for an ounce of gold to soar to $2,000 or $3,000 or higher and for silver to increase in value proportionately too, if the ultimate consequences turn out to be a police state in this country, then a supranational re regime <coughs> replacing the United States accompanied by endless military conflicts throughout the world. In the grand scheme of things, gold and silver are far less important as economic investments or hedges against hyperinflation or depression than they are as guarantors of individual freedom and then to the fullest extent only when they are actually used as media of exchange throughout society. 
Silver and gold as currencies supply the foundation necessary for economic democracy and limited government, whereas fiat currencies inevitably and invariably function as the tools of fascism, socialism, and every other form of financial imperialism. Thus, the fight over gold and silver as media of exchange is about more than mere money, let alone making money, because it is a fight with only two possible outcomes. Either control of their own lives by the people themselves in this country and the rest of the world, or control of the people and their lives by political and economic elitists. To achieve the first and to avoid the second, no price will be too great to pay. Thank you.